The last set of fallacies that we'll study concern three types, fallacies of presumption, fallacies of ambiguity, and fallacies of grammatical analogy. Fallacies of presumption have premises that presume what they purport to prove. Fallacies of ambiguity have premises or a conclusion that do have ambiguity, and fallacies of grammatical analogy mean that there is a syntactical analogy, but the meaningful analogy does not exist. Here are some examples. With the fallacy of presumption, the first form is called begging the question, and it is circular reasoning. Why? Here, the conclusion is actually used as a premise, and the conclusion, which needs to be proved, is assumed and used in place of reasons to support it. Sometimes the circular reasoning is not always evident, and here is an example. Capital punishment is justified for the crimes of murder and kidnapping because it is quite legitimate and appropriate that someone be put to death for having committed such hateful and inhuman acts. Here, the word justified means legitimate and appropriate. So really, since the words mean the same in both the premise and the conclusion, this indicates there are no sufficient reasons given for the conclusion. Another form of begging the question is when a key premise is ignored. That is, if the premise would be included, it may change your conclusion. Here is an example. Murder is morally wrong. This being the case, it follows that abortion is morally wrong. Well, the missing premise to this argument is the answer to this very important question. Is the fetus a person? With that premise missing, it is not possible to claim that abortion is morally wrong. Another fallacy of presumption is called the complex question, or I like to call it a QQ, a question inside of a question. Here, the arguer attempts to trap the listener by having a question that has another question inside of it. Here are some examples. Have you stopped cheating on your exams? You might answer yes. You're still in trouble. Or you might answer no and you're still in trouble. You see, there are two questions in one. First, do you cheat on your exams? And have you stopped cheating on your exams? See if you can find the complex question in this next example. Where did you hide the cookies? Well, first, did you hide the cookies? And second, where? Another fallacy of presumption is called a false dichotomy. And here the situation is presented where two alternatives that are mutually exclusive, that is, there is no overlap at all between them, uh, and, and they are presented as being mutually exclusive when they are not. Here is an example. Either you support the Patriot Act or you don't deserve to be called a loyal American. Yesterday, you didn't vote for the expanded powers of this new law. Therefore, you don't deserve to be called a loyal American. You can see here that the choices are presented as being entirely separate from one another. But we know that there are loyal Americans who do not support the Patriot Act. Therefore, this is not a dichotomy. It is a false dichotomy. Another fallacy of presumption is called suppressed evidence. Key evidence is ignored, and if it were included, it would definitely change your conclusion. Here is an example. Most dogs are friendly and pose no threat to people who pet them. Therefore, it would be safe to pet this little dog that is approaching us. 
But what is not mentioned is that the little dog is foaming at the mouth. Fallacies of ambiguity have ambiguous premises or conclusion. And the first one we're looking at is called an equivocation. Here, a single word or phrase is used in two different senses in the same argument. Here is an example. Some triangles are obtuse. Whatever is obtuse is ignorant. Therefore, some triangles are ignorant. Here you see there are two different meanings of the word obtuse used in the same argument. An amphiboly is when there is an ambiguous statement that the listener misinterprets. Here's our example. Mr. Jones went outside to watch the fireworks go up in his pajamas. We must conclude that Mr. Jones had an exciting evening. Well, that certainly is ambiguous. We could change that by rearranging the modifying clause. We could say, Mr. Jones went outside in his pajamas to watch the fireworks go up. Now there is no ambiguity as to what really happened. The next example, Professor Johnson said that he will give a lecture about heart failure in the biology lecture hall. It must be the case that there are a number of heart failures that have occurred there recently. Well, here again we have a modifying clause in the biology lecture hall which is misplaced. We need to rearrange the sentence to avoid the ambiguity. Professor Johnson said that in the biology lecture hall he will give a lecture about heart failure. The conclusion then is not going to be silly at all. Fallacies of grammatical analogy have a syntactical analogy present within them, but the meaningful analogy is missing. In composition, we give an attribute to the single part and transfer that attribute to the whole group. Here is an example. Each player on this basketball team is an excellent athlete, therefore the team is an excellent team. Well, you can see in this case that even though the individuals may be excellent, they may not have very good teamwork at all, and that may be the downfall of the team. You cannot transfer the characteristic of the part to the whole group. This is called a fallacy of composition. Here is another example. Each atom in this piece of chalk is invisible, therefore the chalk is invisible. Division works in just the opposite manner. Here an attribute is given to the whole group and wrongly transferred to the parts of the group. Here are some examples. The average American family has 2.5 children. The Jones family is an average American family Therefore, the Jones family has 2.5 children.